Well, today is Father's Day, and we want to give, give at least some recognition. While I was in the prison working, at M Mother's Day, they would ask for these cards, sometimes five or six of them, for mothers. That was for their wife, their girlfriend, uh, their grandmother, and somebody, anybody else. On Father's Day, they almost never asked for cards. Father's Day was not a big event, probably not in the world, but we have a significant part to play. <clears throat> Today we're going to be continuing our study of the book of John. And John 16, facing the unexpected, but actually it deals with something else as well, the plan and the will of God. I uh, watched recently the Monk series on Netflix. It's kind of a comedy detective show, really interesting. And I like a little tune that would be playing at the beginning. And the tune said, it's a jungle out there, discord and confusion everywhere. Well, that's the way the disciples were. They were confused by what Jesus was saying, and he did not clearly spell out for them what God's plan and will for their lives were. We understand that. We go through life and we try to ask God, God, what do you want me to do? What is your plan for my life? And he doesn't tell us very much, and that which he does tell us is confusing, and he says to wait. So in this, these verses that we're looking at today, uh, there is a time of confusion, a time of change, and a time of uh, understanding, a, a time of revealing. Now, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it talks about there being a time on earth for everything, a time to weep, a time to rejoice. Well, these verses tell us there is a time to be confused, a time of confusion. In John 16, beginning with verse 16, Jesus went on to say, in a little while, while you see me, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more, and then after a little while, uh, you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Uh, Jesus saw they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. You know, as you go through life, you realize that Jesus wasn't always clear about what he was saying. Uh, one way we know this is because he spoke in parables. Uh, there was a, a metaphor, and it wasn't always clear exactly what he was saying. In fact, the Bible says he never spoke without telling a parable, and many times the disciples would go up to him after and say, Lord, what do you mean by that? And that's what they're asking here. Lord, Speak plainly. We don't understand what you're saying. We go through that same thing. Even after 2,000 years, we don't completely understand all the parables of the Bible. And then Jesus was confusing about the kingdom. Now, the Jews understood the kingdom. They thought the greatest time of the kingdom of God was under David and Solomon. So they thought the Messiah was going to come and restore that earthly kingdom, perhaps to go throughout all the world. But they were wrong. Jesus' kingdom was not talking about a piece of land, wasn't talking about bricks or stone. It was talking about the kingdom being in the hearts and minds of men and women. The kingdom was very different. And then John the Baptist, you recall, even when he was in prison, sent a message to Jesus. He had baptized Jesus. He knew who he was, and he said, Lord, are you the one, or should we look for another? 
It was confusing. Remember, it is getting time for Jesus' farewell. And he wants the disciples to understand as much as they can. And part of that was about the plan of God. And he was still speaking in parables, and they did not understand. And they were saying, Lord, tell us the plan. What exactly are you saying? Well, I've been seeking God's will for most of my life, last 50 years or so especially, most of that time in the ministry, but I still don't understand a lot of things. I don't understand why uh, there is murder in the world, why there are wars, why there's disease and earthquakes, terrible things happening. You watch the news, and it all seems to be bad news. Why doesn't God do something and correct all of that? I really don't know. I do know the Bible says that I can't begin to understand the Almighty God. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. God is so far above us, we couldn't even comprehend if he carefully laid out the plan. I went to my first church as pastor when I was still in my 20s. And I had almost completed my doctoral degree and actually finished that within a few months. My wife was rushing me because I had to pay every semester even if I wasn't going to classes. Finished that, and I considered that first church to be my apprenticeship. Well, you know, at that point I had a doctoral degree. I had experience. I I was ready to move on to the next church, and I figured it would be a much larger church that Somebody had to do that, and I was qualified to do it. Well, the Church of My Dreams actually sent a pulpit committee to the church. They talked to me. They went away. About that same time, I got a call from another church, a church in South Dakota. It wasn't a bigger church. It was a church with 15 or 20 people at most. They had lost the building because they couldn't pay for it. The home mission board took it over. They asked me to come in view of a call, and I didn't want to go and waste their time and their money. But I thought to myself, well, if they ask me to come and do a revival, if I conduct a revival, at least they won't lose anything, because I'm not going there. I've got three small children. I don't want them to starve to death. So I, we drove up there, about a three-day drive from Louisiana, and started preaching. And lo and behold, I started feeling that God was maybe leading me there. And the feeling got stronger and stronger. And to my chagrin, at the end of that time, they said, would you come as our pastor? And I didn't give them an answer because I didn't want to go. Too cold, not enough money. Uh, I didn't, just didn't want to go there. So I began driving back, and I was praying a lot because I knew that the church of my dreams was probably going to ask me to come. But I felt an overwhelming sense of rightness to go to South Dakota for some strange reason, and I did not understand. Finally, somewhere around Dallas, I said, I can't struggle with this anymore. I have to do what God asked me to do. And so I wanted to call that church before I got home because I was afraid that church of my dreams was going to ask me to come as well. So that's what I did. Got home, sure enough, that larger church that paid a whole lot more asked me to come, and I said, no, I've already accepted one. Well, I went there, and God did bless. We bought the building back, and it was paid for in full by the time that I left. Uh, The church began to grow, and did some wonderful things. But, you know, the interesting thing is I found out about my next assignment from there. I was asked to serve as a professor of preaching, if you will. And so I did that for like 11 years. And then I went on to other things. And God led in many strange ways. And I never really understood everything about his plan. But God had a plan for me, but he just didn't reveal all of it at once. So there's a time of confusion, and sometimes we're really confused in knowing what God wants day by day. Then secondly, there's a time 
for change. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when the baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now uh, your time is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I know it will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I am saying you will ask the Father on, on your behalf. A time of change in life. You know, after you become a Christian, God is going to stretch you. And in sign language, the word for stretch is like that. Stretch. Usually the mic doesn't come on when you're using sign language. And anyway, God, God's going to stretch you throughout your life. And the disciples were very much aware of that. Uh, they knew that God was going to stretch them, but they had no idea how much they were going to be stretched. And you know what? Stretching is painful. We don't want to be stretched. We want to be in our own comfort zone, understanding, you know, kind of the will of God, but, you know, not to the point of being stretched. Jesus says, a woman giving birth to a child is in pain. Now, I've not gone through this personally, but I have been in the birthing room, and yet there is some pain. Thank the Lord for epidurals, but childbirth can be really painful. But when the mother looks at the child, she forgets the pain and remembers the joy of that lovely child. No matter how ugly a baby is, the mother thinks he's beautiful. I've seen some ugly babies before, but it, the mother still thought, oh, it'd be gorgeous. Well, yeah, boy, you sure are blessed. You, you, kind of hard to say anything. But anyway, uh, so he, it's compared here to childbirth. And Jesus is also saying that during this time, the Holy Spirit is going to guide you in knowing the will of God. Now, what he's talking about, the pain, the disciples are going to be in pain very shortly because Jesus was going to be captured, tried, and crucified on a cross, and they were going to be very sad. But then a little later, he was going to be raised, and they were going to be glad, and they were going to forget about the pain that they had experienced. Now, over the years in my almost 50 years of ministry, I, I've served approximately six churches, one church actually three times, which is strange because they let me come back again and again. It's kind of hard to get rid of. But I can tell you something, being a pastor of a church is not a bowl of cherries. Boy, there's some stretching that goes on. You would think that, and in my first church, I was optimistic. Yeah, everything is going to be wonderful. Uh, no problems, but yeah, there were problems. Uh, God stretches us. And I think every time we are stretched, God is producing something in us. He's developing our faith. You think most of us here are getting older somewhat elderly. And you'd think that God would say, well, yep, that's a done deal. You know, no more stretching. No, it doesn't work that way. Abraham was an old man when his son Isaac was born. And you can imagine how much he loved Isaac. But God stretched him. He said, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him to me. Probably the most gut-wrenching thing that Abraham ever, ever had to face. And yet he was willing to do that. Now, God didn't have him to kill the son. God was testing his faith. Even as an old man, God was still working in his life. And I can say, God's still working in your life and in my life. We are not yet exactly where he wants us to be in his plan. Uh, the Pharisees 
were confused because God was calling upon them to change. They thought they had this God thing nailed down. They were to obey the laws of God, and that was the way to be acceptable before God. But Jesus said, no, <laughs> that has nothing to do with your relationship. Yes, God wants obedience, but God wants faith in me. Disciples were not ready to, the, the Pharisees were not ready to change in that way. And so they decided to murder him, to kill him, because they did not like what he was saying and they didn't want to stretch. Remember Jesus told the parable of the wine and the wineskins? He said, you don't put new wine in an old wine skin. The reason is the wine is bubbling up and it's uh, expanding and the old wine skin is so rigid that eventually it's going to burst the wine skin, the wine is going to be spilled and the wine skin is going to be destroyed. Sometimes our religion is like that. We think we've got God nailed down like the Pharisee. We have everything figured out and God is not going to change anything. We have these rules and these traditions and these regulations that we need to be following. These rules are more important than the will of God, but no, God stretches us because he wants us to change and we must always be flexible and open to the will of God with whatever he wants. Uh, you recall Peter after the ascension. Peter thought that he had everything figured out with God. God wanted him to go to the Jews and preach the gospel, baptize them and teach them, and that was a wrap. No. Uh, one day he was resting on the rooftop and had a vision of this sheet coming down from heaven. And there were all kinds of animals, the clean and the unclean. And a voice said, take and eat. And Peter said, in all my life, I've never eaten anything unclean. And the voice said, do not declare something unclean that I have made clean. And just as he finished up the vision, there was a knock at the door. Cornelius, a centurion, a leader of soldiers sent a messenger to get Peter because God told him to do so. So Peter reluctantly went to the house of Cornelius, went into the house, which a Jew was not supposed to do, told him about Christ, and lo and behold, Cornelius and his whole household believed in the Lord Jesus, and then as proof of it, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter said, I can see that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't distinguish between Jew and Gentile. He wants all men to come to him. That was a revelation. Peter did not understand, but God stretched him. Then Paul had an encounter. You know, he went around the Mediterranean on his missionary journeys, and he decided one day, well, he was going to retrace the steps he had taken before, go and strengthen and encourage the churches. But God had another plan. He had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come and help us. And so he changed his plans to conform to God's plan. And it's a good thing that he went because eventually from there, Europe received the gospel and most of us are Europeans, at least in background. And so we might not be believers if Paul had not listened to the voice of God. So what does this mean for us? Okay, if you get too comfortable in your faith, if you depend upon your traditions, your rules, your regulations, God, you know, is going to change you. Sometimes we are inflexible. We don't want to change, and yet it is a nature of the Christian life. God's going to change us. And then finally, there's a time of revealing. It's as though I've been speaking figuratively. A time is coming when you, I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. A time of revealing. The disciples wanted to know God's will. They were asking about the plan of God. They wanted him to explain completely, but he said, not now. At a later time, I will explain it all. 
Verse 26, in that day you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask your questions. This makes us believe that you came from the Father. Uh, do you believe? Jesus replied. Now notice they didn't say, we understand, we know all things. They said Jesus knew all things. He understood uh, the mind of God. See, God has a plan for every one of us. But he doesn't always reveal that plan. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus said, take it one day at a time. You probably don't know what God's going to do in your life in five years or 15 years or five days, but you can probably figure out the will of God for today. And that's all you really need to know. Now, what if Jesus had said to the disciples, Okay, I'm going to tell you everything that's going to happen. Here's the way it's going to pan out. First of all, in a few days, I'm going to be arrested and crucified, and you're going to be really sad. Then, three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead, and I'll see you again. But I'm not going to stay there the whole time. For 40 days, I'm going to appear again and again and again, then I'm going to be raised, ascended unto the Father. And when that happens, I'm going to do something you've never expected. I am going to send the promised Holy Spirit to you. And you're going to have a power that you have never known before. You're going to go into all the world. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to baptize. You're going to instruct. But that's not the end. You're going to preach in another way at the end of your life. You're going to be preaching a sermon through your death. And that sermon on death may be the greatest sermon of all. People are going to see the faith that you have in me even to the point of death. And they're going to believe by the thousands because of that. He didn't do that. The disciples weren't ready for all of that. He gave them only what they needed to know right then. He was saying, I'm going to die, you're going to be sad. I'm going to be raised, you're going to be glad. It was plain, but it wasn't the whole story. You and I need to wait on the will of God. God's going to give you his plan, but just one step at a time. If when I was in my 20s, God had told me what was going to happen in my life, I would have been totally confused. I had no idea I was going to be going to a small church. Had no idea that I'd be a professor for 11 years, or that I was going to go back to Louisiana and start working in a prison as a chaplain and finally retiring as a deputy warden. I had no idea about that. And lo and behold, I certainly had no idea one day I would be in Mexico serving a Presbyterian church instead of a Baptist church. Those things I didn't understand. I had no idea, and yet God knew from the very beginning. He didn't reveal all that to me, and he did not need to reveal it all. We like things that are instant. I've, in the last year and a half, we had these artificial intelligence chats, and I've used many of them, u.com and uh, Google Bard, which is now Gemini now, and uh, the, the Microsoft version. But the oldest version was ChatGPT, and it is still, as far as I can tell, still the, far, the fastest. Well, about two weeks ago or so, my nephew said that he had had a contact stuck in his eye. He slept with a contact. He had to be pulled off. And afterwards, he didn't have any money, so he said, can, can you order me a pair of glasses? I said, well, do you have a prescription? He said, only a prescription for the contacts. I said, okay, send that to me. So I took that and I went to a 
eyeglass site that was really cheap. And he couldn't use that prescription because that prescription for the contacts was different than the one for the glasses. So I said, huh, I'll go to chat GPT, and I did. I said, can you take a prescription for contacts and change it to glasses? He said, yes. So I gave the prescription, and as soon as I hit enter, it started responding. I mean, instantly. I don't know how it does it that fast. It not only gave me the new prescription, it told me how it arrived at the figures that it did. So I ordered those glasses for my wayward nephew, and he should have probably received them by now. Instant. We, we want instant for everything, including God's will and plan for our lives. And we want it to be clear and not ambiguous in any way. In, in my home, uh, I have a lot of instant things. My wife is somewhat instant. Uh, but I also have, I have instant coffee. I have instant miso soup that my wife buys at Soriano. We love the miso soup. Have an instant packet. I even have packs of instant grits. Now, if you're not from Louisiana, you probably don't know exactly what grits is. You might have heard of it, but grits are wonderful. My wife likes everything, but she doesn't like grits. I don't understand that. <laughs> we want God to respond to us instantly. So why does he do not do that? Why didn't God just tell us everything? I've concluded after all these years that there is a point to what God is doing. As I struggle with the plan of God, the will of God, I have learned more by the struggle than I have by the answer. What God wants to happen is for you and me to develop the mind of Christ. And so he delays giving us the full picture because we're not ready, and he also wants to change us to be conformed to the image of Christ. And he does that by telling us to wait. So in the will of God, there's confusion. We don't understand and looking forward exactly what God is doing. But then there's a point of change, of stretching. And God is going to continually stretch you and me for the rest of our lives. You're never going to be at the, arrive at the point where God doesn't want to change you, to stretch you like the new wine in the new wineskin. And never become so rigid that you can't listen to the voice of God speaking to you. And then finally, there's going to be a revelation about God's plan. Maybe in looking back, you can see parts of it, but in looking forward, it's still not very clear. And it may be that the final revelation is not going to come in this world. It's going to be coming in the next world. God wants you to be a part of his plan. And he wants you to work on that day by day, taking it one day at a time. Would you bow with me? Gracious Father and Almighty God, thank you so much that you do not give us everything, but you work all things out according to your plan because you know where we're going and you know what you want to accomplish in us. For truly, O oh God, your thoughts are not my thoughts and your ways are not my ways. Thank you that you have a plan that is much better than any that I could ever devise. Father, forgive us for not following that plan day by day. And we pray that your ultimate will can still be accomplished in our lives. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.